so dear uh, friends we are about to start so today we have an excellent uh, topic and a, an excellent uh, speaker so i don't think uh, you need any introduction uh, for uh, dr binila chako she is uh, uh, like professor of critical care medicine in st john's uh, sorry in uh, uh, cmc uh, vellore and uh, she is a very good speaker like those who have attended her uh, talk during our critical care conference would have really experienced that and especially very beautiful uh, slides as well and even uh, uh, like last time and all i still remember in south zone conference uh, she did a, a sepsis uh, talk itself there are excellent slides we like to say that and i was even trying to decode that and learn how to do the way she was animating and all and uh, she is a, uh, a good teacher i already told so after her mt medicine she was trained in australia then later on again she uh, uh, came back and was working in cmc vellore completed uh, dm critical care uh, medicine all, also and she is uh, too much passionate in teaching so i think uh, she will continue with us and uh, her uh, uh, passion for teaching i think uh, we will be able to utilize and again especially our dm dnb trainees i think uh, will be uh, uh, really benefited with uh, uh, her teaching skills so over to dr binila uh, thank you dr anup uh, i'll just get started and uh, please let me know if you can uh, hear me uh, clearly shares yeah. um yeah perfectly all right you can start are you able are you able to see yeah yeah your screen is visible this light voice is also perfect all right so um, good morning to all the people good good evening see i'm i'm so confused about the time of the day also um to everyone who's uh, attending the uh, session um now this talk uh, is a talk on persistent sepsis i have given this talk a modified version of this talk in south zone a couple of years ago and uh, it's always uh, refreshing to take something other than covid uh, in this uh, this time of the year um so just once some you, you can just uh, press the slide once and then yeah ah uh, yes yeah okay so uh, we'll have some um, interactions as well during the session so uh, i would request dr anup and dr sanish to let me know if there are uh, people willing to answer the questions uh, as the slides go on um, so this is a patient uh, who is actually in the icu right now a 40 year old man who is pre morbidly well came in with fever and breathlessness for a day and he was in uh, warm shock when he presented to the casualty uh, requiring uh, both fluid resuscitation and uh, noradrenaline um so he was uh, this was his x ray if you can see so this is x ray actually after intubation he was not intubated initially and you can see there's a little bit of a mid zone uh, opacity on the right lung uh, these were his uh, test reports what i have highlighted in red are the abnormal test reports you can see that he's got a leukocytosis uh shift to the left with increasing band forms thrombocytopenia uh normal urea creat slightly borderline creat is what i would say and uh lft which shows uh, uh increased sgot sgpt and a mildly increased uh, alkaline phosphatase so this patient uh was uh as i said initially he wasn't the ward uh before coming to icu and he was started on fipronil and tazobactam uh and doxycycline a uh, few weeks back uh some of you may have heard a uh, talk by dr jv peter where he would have taken you through rickettsial infections which is fairly common um and we are starting to see that uh, right now in velor as well uh so this was the combination that was given to him because you know he was fitting in something like a scrub typhus also and uh, that was the initial um, antibiotics that was uh, put in for him however within a day itself uh, if you can see here you can see that the blood culture uh, grew uh, gram negative bacteria enterobacter uh, species and he was subsequently shifted to icu and you can see that over the next 48 hours he's been having continuous uh, fever spikes um the inotropes went up from uh, 8 to 24 and he he added of uh, vasopressin also needed to be added and he also developed new organ dysfunction uh with an acute kidney injury this was however non alcuric and the creatinine went up to 1.8 mg per deciliter um so 
I just want you to keep the, this case presentation in mind because we will be coming back to this uh, during the, the session. Uh, so in this patient um, is a patient who did not respond to the antibiotics that were given to him. And he was uh, what you would say a persistent sepsis or what people would think of persistent sepsis. So in this talk, I'll be taking you through uh, what persistent sepsis is, the, uh, why it actually happens. Um, can I just, I think this is on a timed mode. Can I just stop it and just get back? Otherwise, this is going to keep on. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, please. okay, fine. I'll just come back. Um, <coughs> okay. Uh, am I back on? Can you see the screen? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, all right. So you would say a patient has persistent sepsis when uh, there is persistent or worsening micro or macro circulatory dysfunction okay so when you say microcirculatory function could be dysfunction it would be like maybe increasing lactate or uh, microcirculatory dysfunction as uh, evidenced by organ dysfunction but this remember should be in a patient who is on appropriate treatment for suspected or confirmed sepsis just want you th to think back of the case that we saw earlier this is a 40 year old gentleman who had an enterobacter bacteremia and he was on piprizolin tazobactam and doxycycline so um, it is possible that some may think it is appropriate, but we all know that Enterobacter is one of the escapum organisms and may actually have resistance. And hence uh, the antibiotic in this situation uh, was most likely uh, not appropriate. Um, now, how would you actually define antibiotic treatment failure? Um, there is no consensus definition for this. Um, if you look at different literatures, the rates vary from 6 to 60%, depending upon the type of infection, whether it's a pneumonia, soft tissue infection. And uh, the different criteria have been uh, used for uh, defining antibiotic treatment failure. This could be patient-based criteria. So that's what we use at the bedside. You may see persistent fever spikes, as we saw in this patient. The patient also developed new organ dysfunction, or you may have an early death, unexpected death. So these are criteria which you may use based on patient criteria to say that the antibiotic is actually not working. Secondly, you may have treatment based, you may have like in this patient also the inotropes you saw increased and that increasing organ support could be an indication that antibiotics are not working. And thirdly, you may actually have tests to support, like if you have a, a good microbiological lab which can tell you what the sensitivity is, or if you have increasing biomarkers, we all know that um, serial procalcitonin increase could be an indication that you are probably not on the right track. And as I mentioned earlier, cultures uh, uh, and sensitivity helps in actually uh, figuring out whether the, you're on the right track with regards to antibiotics. Now, when do you actually say that the antibiotic is not worked? Is it one day? Is it two days, three days? When can you actually say that the antibiotics are not working? Now, I would say that there's no golden time period. Like if I see uh, in a patient who comes to ICU, I see within 24 hours, the patient is not improving, things are getting worse for me and inotropes are, or there's increasing organ dysfunction. I would say that yes, probably I'm not on the right track and I may consider changing or increasing uh, the dose of my antibiotics that I'm on. Uh, if you look at classical uh, pneumonia, people generally say a uh, time period of 48 to 72 hours before which they would actually say that the antibiotic is not working. Now, this is a very important uh, thing to keep in mind because antibiotic treatment failure has been associated with worse outcomes, increased mortality, length of stay in hospital and in ICU. So coming back again to this patient and just to recap the definition of persistent sepsis, this is a patient who had persistent fever. He had new organ dysfunction. Uh, would we say that this patient had persistent sepsis? I would say that he doesn't really fulfill the definition of criteria of persistence. Yes, his sepsis is persistent, but the most important thing is his antibiotic was not appropriate and uh, should possibly have been uh, escalated when, we, when the inotropes were going up. So now let's look at uh, why uh, the patient is persistently septic. So we have to, as clinicians, we need to analyze the problem. And uh, you may have a persistent culture positive. 
which uh, could be because of a result of host factors, drug factors, or bug factors. Okay, one of the things which I find uh, most of the time, uh, it is because we are not giving the right drug or we haven't hit on the right diagnosis and we're missing complications. That is generally what we see uh, when we see that uh, the cultures are persistently positive and the patient is persistently septic. And we must remember that the outcome of every patient actually depends upon um, the interaction between these three factors, the host factors, drug factors, and bug factors. Alternatively, you may have a persistent sepsis and the patient may be culture negative. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen hematology patients. Uh, hematology patients are one of the most frustrating patients to have in ICU. Uh, when I look back to see how many of them have actually had a positive culture, majority of them have actually had culture negative, but they are fulfilling criteria for sepsis. So this is what we'll call a culture negative sepsis. The next thing is we need to actually think, is it actually a bacterial sepsis? I mean, does the patient need something else? Does the patient need an antifungal? Um, or could it be a non-infective cause? Uh, remember that many times there are a lot of sepsis mimics which are non-infective uh, causes. So let's move on to the host factors which we talked about earlier. So host factors actually uh, can um, several genetic polymorphisms, which I'm not going to go into in this talk, can actually affect the way the host responds uh, to, Ill to a particular illness. And uh, you may have people who have a blunted host immune response, like you may have a diabetic or a patient with uh, an immunocompromised state uh, who may not be able to mount an appropriate uh, uh, response to the infection, uh, to fight the infection. But what I will be focusing on mainly uh, in the next few slides are the pharmacokinetic changes which happened in the critically ill, uh, which uh, are very important uh, in understanding um, uh, to ensure that your patient is getting uh, appropriate treatment. And I will also be dealing with the problem of inadequate source control and complications over the next few slides. This is a very nice uh, article which is published in The Lancet 2014. Uh, one thing we all must understand is the critically ill patient, unlike the patients who may be in the general wards, have wide variations in their uh, pharmacokinetics uh, due to the altered pathophysiology. And it is very important for us to actually understand uh, what these pharmacokinetic changes are, to keep in mind these pharmacokinetic changes uh, to help us ensure that we are giving our patients the best possible care. Uh, now, I don't know how many of you enjoyed pharmacology as a medical student. Uh, it wasn't certainly my favorite subject, but uh, we need to know some things to uh, keep us going in critical care. So if you look at the drug concentration, it is affected by absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. And um, broadly, if you look at antibiotics, there are two types of antibiotics. You've got the time-dependent antibiotics, which you can see here, the time-dependent antibiotics, and you've got concentration-dependent antibiotics. Um, are you still able to see the slides clearly? Okay, so the time dependent. Sides are fine. No issues. Sides are fine. Okay, so the time dependent antibiotic, uh, the um, what is important actually, what you see here is the time above the MIC. Okay, and the classical example for a time dependent antibiotic, uh, where you need adequate time above the MIC for uh, killing of the bacteria for bactericidal action is beta lactams. Okay. The second major uh, type of uh, antibiotic is the concentration-dependent antibiotic, where there are two important mechanisms. It's either the peak concentration that you see here, or it is the area under the curve above the MIC, which is important. And the classical example here of a concentration-dependent antibiotic is aminoglycosides. Now, I'm going to show you a lot of antibiotics here, but I thought I'm not going to show you all the antibiotics which are listed in a pharmacology textbook, but uh, just show you antibiotics that we actually use in our clinical practice, okay? Now, you can see different colors here, which I have put. There's a white color and a yellow color. Uh, now, the white colored antibiotics are the uh, hydrophilic antibiotics, and the yellow color are the lipophilic antibiotics. And why, it is, why this is actually important, I will come to in the next few slides. So you can see the time-dependent antibiotics 
antibiotics are a lot of antibiotics which we use in intensive care commonly are beta lactams carbapenems um acyclovir occasionally fluconazole sometimes linozolid as well is get gets used so these are all time dependent antibiotics okay so that means you need to have adequate level of these antibiotics throughout the day to ensure adequate to ensure appropriate uh, bactericidal action next you have is the concentration dependent where you where you, what i talked about is the cmax the peak concentration is very important the classical example is aminoglycosides and uh, you will notice about most of these drugs that are written here aminoglycosides daptomycin amphotericin the dose is a once daily dose you are giving a maximum dose once daily you want to hit a proper concentration to ensure adequate uh, uh, bactericidal action and the next group of drugs are drugs which are dependent on both concentration and time and that's where the area under the curve comes to the picture and that is where you have vancomycin colistin quinolones doxycycline tegecycline linozolid okay you can see colistin here in a bit of white and a bit of yellow because it's got both hydrophilic and lipophilic properties okay so time dependent antibiotics where you need to ensure a constant level of antibiotics throughout the day concentration dependent antibiotics where it is c max dependent there usually the antibiotics are given once daily preferably to ensure appropriate action and antibiotics which are dependent on both area under the curve you need to give it at an appropriate dose to ensure adequate concentration and generally many of these antibiotics are given at least twice or thrice daily so in uh, the critically ill uh, volume of distribution as you all know is uh, increased due to several reasons okay there's a lot of third spacing which happens um, hypoalbuminemia which adds to it acute kidney injury also uh, can uh, increase the volume of distribution and occasionally we do have patients on ecmo or renal replacement therapy all of which can increase the volume of distribution okay now what is why is this actually important okay so in uh, what kind of drugs does this pharmacokinetic change actually impact now the kind of drugs that this impacts is mainly the hydrophilic antibiotics the antibiotics which are uh, you know which are uh, more uh, water uh, dependent so that is your uh, aminoglycosides beta lactams colistin vancomycin ticoplenin dap daptomycin so these are all very common antibiotics that we use so if you just want to keep in mind most of the antibiotics that we use in intensive care Uh, are generally uh, hydrophilic antibiotics and so one thing you need to remember is if you have a time dependent antibiotic like your beta lactams okay so those time dependent antibiotics you if you have an increased volume of uh, volume of distribution we are going to have sub therapeutic drug levels and if you have a concentration dependent the peak concentration actually comes down because of the increased volume of uh, distribution and so when you think back we kind of realize that when you have sub therapeutic drug levels or less time uh, above the mic for a time dependent antibiotic you're going to have ineffective bactericidal action okay so essentially it's very important to ensure that for hydrophilic antibiotics uh you need to ensure that a loading dose is given it's very important to give a loading dose to ensure that you have a good time above the mic and adequate maintenance doses now this increase in volume of distribution does not really affect the lipophilic antibiotics as you can see here the quinolones clindamycin tegecycline minocycline linozolid so this doesn't usually get affected by the increased volume of distribution um this uh, and hence this does not impact the dosing of the lipophilic antibiotics except in situations like ecmo where you know sometimes these lipophilic antibiotics get absorbed to the ecmo circuit and hence you may have ineffective drug levels uh when uh, of maybe if you're using tegecycline or linozolid you may have to give a higher dose to ensure that you have appropriate uh levels of these antibiotics now hypoalbuminemia also Uh, is a very common uh, a problem which we see in uh, intensive care and uh, while this can actually increase you have a hypoalbuminemia uh, the protein bound drugs there will be an increased free drug 
of the protein bound drugs okay uh, while this can increase you know you can increase the free drug we must remember the previous problem that we discussed earlier you have an increased volume of distribution and sometimes you have an entity called augmented renal clearance which i'll come to in the next slide and hence uh, really even though you've got an increased free drug it doesn't really change the uh, or or help in increasing the drug levels of these antibiotics okay the um, the the drugs which are more affected um, uh, here which uh, you know you may actually if you look at the hydrophilic antibiotics like the beta lactams ticoplenin and daptomycin these drugs actually the drug levels may not change very much whereas these drugs tg cyclin clindamycin and erythromycin Uh, which are not hydrophilic and are more lipophilic these drugs may actually have a much higher effect um now uh, additionally you may have alteration so those were the factors which affected the distribution of drugs increased volume of distribution and the hypoalbuminemia uh, uh metabolism like it 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 is more so if you have drugs which are like rifampicin which is also added along which is which are enzyme inducers and these may actually decrease your antibiotic drug levels it's not a very common problem that we see uh, but occasionally you may have patients on rifampicin as well and antibiotics now augmented renal clearance an entity which i talked about a few slides earlier is a concept which was introduced in 2010 which is uh, typically defined as a creatinine clearance more than 130 ml per minute body surface area and this has been reported to be as high as 80% of critically ill patients and uh, more so in the younger men uh, less than 55 people with trauma uh, sepsis burns or uh, hematological malignant disease and pancreatitis Uh, there are a lot of uh, scoring systems which you can use at the bedside. Uh, the ARC scoring system has a high sensitivity and can tell you whether the patient uh, is uh, uh, possible, possibly going to have an augmented uh, renal clearance as uh, defined as by the CREAT clearance. How? What does this actually affect? How does this actually affect your drug levels? What you can see here is the augmented renal clearance tends to affect the drugs. uh the concentration dependent where the area under the curve is affected and the time above the mic so you can see that because of augmented renal clearance which is an entity described very often in sepsis you can actually have sub therapeutic exposure of renally cleared antibiotics that is again your beta lactams vancomycin ticoplenin polymyxin linezolid quinolones so what we are seeing right now is you know you have a lot of factors which can actually contribute uh to inadequate drug levels in sepsis okay so you've got increased volume of distribution you've got uh, uh, augmented renal clearance all of which can result in decreased levels of uh, meropenem uh, colistin vancomycin uh, ticoplenin linezolid and aminoglycosides so all these antibiotics are very very commonly used in intensive care i'm sure everyone is familiar with this it is hence extremely important to bear in mind that you must give an appropriate loading dose you must give uh, adequate maintenance dose and it's very important for the time dependent drugs to give infusions and concentration dependent drugs you must make sure that you're giving an appropriate uh, maybe the uh, the higher end dose of the antibiotic to ensure that you have adequate drug levels lipophilic drugs are not affected as much as the hydrophilic drugs but you must remember if your patients are on ecmo drugs like quinolones digicyclin macrolide you may need to increase the dose so um this slides and here will be available for you to look at later it is not possible to remember all this but just remember that the drugs that we use very commonly in icu can have sub therapeutic drug levels and we must be cautious to ensure that we're giving appropriate uh uh doses uh, as recommended dr birla can i just interrupt yes there are uh, uh, two questions asked here one is sure. whether linezolid is a time dependent or uh, like it's having both the time dependent and concentration dependent action and uh, whether you need a loading dose for linezolid okay so there is no need of a loading dose but just to come back to my uh, slide here if that will help you all to just see that okay so if you just if you look at this group of drugs which are here this is dependent on the area under the curve 
remember that area under the curve drugs are both time and concentration dependent okay both time and concentration dependent so these drugs linozolid does not really have a loading dose digicyclin does have a loading dose uh, but uh, colistin does have a loading dose vancomycin has linozolid does not have a loading dose uh, but uh, in these drugs which are both time and concentration dependent you need to ensure that uh, i mean that's why these drugs are actually given generally twice daily and not a once daily dose twice or thrice daily is that okay yeah yeah fine fine all right i'll just get back uh, okay so uh, these were all the pharmacokinetic changes which we need to keep in mind as we uh, uh, are managing our patients in intensive care uh, it is also very very important to ensure that we are uh, looking for the source um i keep telling my registrars we are not you know we are not intensivists just to manage the numbers okay or to optimize the blood pressure with inotropes you need to actually figure out like detectors look for what are the what is the source of the sepsis and are there any potential complications any foci which need draining or debridement look for the commonly missed sites like sinusitis prostate intra abdominal foci endocarditis these are all uh, sources which you need to look for if you haven't been able to clinch the diagnosis so we've briefly dealt with the host factors there are uh, you know this can go on and on and uh, but uh, i'll i'll stick to just that just for us to mull on those basics uh, now we also need to look at now the drug factors um are we actually giving the right drug how do you know you're giving the right drug uh, that is based on uh, generally based on the whether the bug is susceptible to the drug and this is done by different methods in the lab you've got disk diffusion methods this is the uh, the e test which determines your mic and the micro broth dilution technique which is the technique which is specifically recommended from focalist and what i understand from the microbiology department here at cmc is there several labs which actually do not do the microbrot dilution technique but do the e test and that can give a falsely wrong mic a little bit more on the mic it's very important the technique of determining mic is very important uh um, it is important that the sample is appropriately incubated at an appropriate temperature for the fixed period of time uh all of us know that four times the mic generally uh, results in a bactericidal action and that is how the antibiotics are dosed um we should remember that uh we are very dependent on the lab uh, but they can be errors as well uh the bug may be reported as falsely susceptible now this is a a very major error and this can happen if the in the lab a smaller inoc inoculum is used for testing if it is incubated for a short period uh, and this can result in the wrong antibiotic being given and persistent sepsis then resulting or you can have a falsely resistant uh, report which is also a major error because this can result in antibiotic misuse we all know that our antibiotics are already uh, we have a very limited stock of antibiotics and uh, if you have a falsely resistant um, uh, report from the lab uh, we are already using up our limited stock of antibiotics and it and uh, our own lab has told us that the same lab repeats the mic you may not actually get the same result and just to give you some examples here just to understand how errors are common now if you look at the tg cyclin susceptibility and resistant mic it is difficult it is uh, usually a lab does not make an error with this because you can see a big difference between the susceptible and the resistant uh, mic values whereas if you look at colistin MIC less than two, MIC more than two, more chances that you can have errors in either direction. So uh, again, uh, coming back uh, to our patient, uh, this patient who was uh, febrile um, and uh, who had a persistent sepsis, um, would anyone want to just tell me what antibiotic you would like to give? Is uh, is it possible for someone to say, or uh, Dr. Anup, or or should i uh, or would they like to give no 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 we will ask okay can i just comment 
does anybody want to comment on uh, i told you earlier that this patient was put on piprazil and tazobactam uh, he had entrobacter isolated in this uh, blood culture uh, anybody wants to comment on the antibiotics that you would want to give for this patient how you would like to give what dose majority are uh, commenting for uh, like vancomycin few of them commented for meropenem 2 gram and okay. uh, someone has commented for ampicillin as well okay so i would say in this this patient we know that the patient was deteriorating very rapidly you know like you know from 8 mics when he came in of norad to 24 mics in addition of one more uh, vasopressor um vaso active agent and new acute kidney injury in this patient and knowing in back no, keeping in mind you need to kind of know a little bit about the common bugs entrobacter is one of the escapum species and hence it is uh, notorious for having uh, resistance we may have to escalate and give meropenem so those who have talked about meropenem giving a loading dose of 2 grams followed by uh, a gram eight hourly is what would be recommended uh, in this situation you may need to add on polistin that depends upon how he is responding to the meropenem uh, or not and follow up remember that even if you give uh, you a very broad spectrum antibiotic always follow up on the cultures and see whether you can de escalate your therapy once the sensitivity pattern uh, comes back so uh we've talked about meropenem and uh, how should you actually give the antibiotic in a uh, uh, few queries coming like yeah. the creatinine clearance in this patient uh, will be low as the creatinine was 1.7 yeah. so yeah. still you want to go with 2 uh, g bolus and 1 g eight hour yes so uh what what is generally recommended at least for the first 24 hours hit them hard with the uh, uh with the antibiotic as would be recommended for a patient with a normal creatinine clearance and from the second day onwards you uh, adjust the antibiotics based on the creatinine clearance is that okay so first day give full dose loading dose with uh the with the recommended antibiotic uh, dosage and from the second day onwards adjust according to the um uh, to the uh, creatinine clearance yeah even if the creatinine clearance is high we will yes. give the full yes, dose yes yes for the first day first 24 hours okay i think that message is very clear okay so as i mentioned earlier loading dose followed by maintenance dose is very very important uh i just want to stress on this fact uh so it's very very important that we give uh, these time dependent antibiotics over an infusion now we don't have data from all the you know time dependent antibiotics and how long but there's a lot of research which has been done on beta lactam infusions and what they have found is when you give an infusion beta lactam infusion over 3 hours uh there's actually a higher concentration above the mic more time above the mic better clinical cure rate and reduced mortality so this is a principle which we follow in our icu where we give uh beta lactam infusions over longer period of time okay 3 hours and uh, rather than a bolus dose okay and uh, preferably i would suggest that all of the time dependent antibiotics that we have seen earlier uh try and ensure that you are giving it as an infusion uh rather than a bolus uh, a load uh, just a stacked uh, dose pushed into the patient so occasionally we do face the situation i'm giving the right bug but why is my patient not improving and that's when you need to step back and look and see are you actually giving the right bug okay so you can see here it is you will have an a bug and you will have heaps of antibiotics to which the bug is actually sensitive sensitive to what antibiotic do you actually give uh, does any ha anyone have any ideas about what antibiotic you would give you know like you have a couple of choices here uh, any any choice any uh, suggestions from the group yeah please comment we are waiting for your suggestions i think uh, Do dr anmar is ready to uh, comment dr anmar you are with us you yes, can sir. introduce yourself and uh, put your remarks Yes, sir. I am Dr. Anwar. I am doing DNB critical care in Hyderabad, Apollo. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Sir, I will go with meropenem. Okay. So I think the the most the first that's uh, I mean that's a. Uh, Your entire goal is meropenem. Sorry. 
majority are uh, opting for mirapen okay open up. only one person okay. has uh, opted for cetriaxone other mm. complete, uh, like other some uh, 15 uh, people have opted for uh, meropen okay. i mean that's fair enough okay that's fair enough okay but before what i just want to stress on say i've just given a random uh, sensitivity report here but i just want to tell you that the the choices of the antibiotic really depends on the clinical situation and what the source of the sepsis is okay so what is the why are you giving the antibiotic uh, for what is the primary source of sepsis that is what we need to think about so if you have a patient with a predominant lung problem okay uh, we need to have adequate concentration of the antibiotic within the lung, within the lung okay and lipophilic and drugs have been shown to have a much better um, Uh, drug levels in the lung as opposed to hydrophilic drugs where the concentrations are much lower so if you just think back i mean i know it's very difficult to uh, to remember all these lipophilic and uh, hydrophilic drugs and uh, not easy to remember but uh, just broadly uh, one antibiotic which is excellent for the lung is uh, fluoroquinolone uh, fluoroquinolone levofloxacin and uh, linozolid as well so suppose you have an mrsa in the lung and there's no bacteremia linozolid would be a good drug to give because it sh- it surely will have uh, a much better uh, level in the lung as opposed to uh, vancomycin vancomycin yes can be given uh, uh, definitely if the patient is bacteremic please give vancomycin because linozolid is more a static drug as opposed to vancomycin which is a sidereal drug now if you look at bone problems um you uh, we tend to have good penetration almost with almost equivalent concentration to serum with rifampicin uh, quinolones again phosphomycin metronidazole clindamycin even colistin also has a uh, reasonable uh, bone penetration but the beta lactams and uh, vancomycin actually do not have a uh, good concentration uh, in the bone so uh, we need to be very careful depending upon the source of the sepsis to choose the antibiotic appropriately similarly in see interrupt, interrupt for a uh, like a, a few seconds yes uh, like uh, dear friends these slides are very very important because i have also such for many literature to get all these information it is very uh, difficult to gather uh, like uh, such a huge uh, information so she has uh, done an extensive uh, literature search to get all these information so please concentrate on this thing tissue concentration of different antibiotic is very very important especially when you are selecting an antibiotic so if you have any doubt please put it in the chat box uh, dr binila will clear that yeah please proceed okay uh so in csf uh, lipophilic drugs are uh, uh, they cross very easily but we all know that you probably be thinking when you have a pneumococcal meningitis the drug which you give is uh, crisline penicillin now cp in the presence of inflamed meninges these drugs actually cross quite easily uh, though dexamethasone may occasionally decrease the penetration but one thing to remember for sure is even in the presence of inflamed meninges aminoglycoside actually has a uh, very poor penetration into the csf and hence should not be considered if a patient has got a uh, meningitis okay so uh we are not right now using uh the right drug okay we we think based on the mic uh based on the source of the sepsis but the patient continues to be still bacteremic and still septic what do you think about any of the people are so this is a frustrating situation you are, you you think you're giving the right thing but still the patient is bacteremic and septic yeah some people Any feel ideas? that the source control is not adequate and a few of them want antifungals and uh, dr guru prasad wanted a, a 2d echo and uh, he wanted to rule out an uh, yes. infective endocarditis yes definitely source control yes 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 definitely for line, definitely autoimmune yes. sources yes okay so definitely thinking of seeding and source control is very very important but again like uh, actually there's a study which we are doing here in velour to actually look at uh, drug doses you know we give colistin to a lot of patients is it actually adequate or not 
Now, there's no way uh, that uh, we do, we, we are doing drug levels for some uh, antibiotics like uh, vancomycin, but uh, and occasionally uh, for carbapenems, uh, but it's not routinely done, okay? And uh, uh, probably, you know, like therapeutic drug monitoring may help, but really there is no uh, evidence to suggest that therapeutic drug monitoring um, does convincingly help in uh, optimizing uh, management of uh, patients with sepsis. So we do need actually a lot more studies. So I would encourage PGs to, they are able to do uh, studies on therapeutic drug monitoring uh, in sepsis uh, that will definitely be very helpful. Uh, I always believe that research from India, we have so many uh, diseases, infections, sepsis, much more than the West. And we actually have, we actually should look at, uh, you know, getting funding to do studies on therapeutic drug monitoring and look at uh, how does that translate to clinical outcomes in patients with sepsis. Now, bug factors, our bugs, we know are terribly resistant. I just want to introduce you all to one concept, which is called uh, the MIC creep, which I've actually personally encountered uh, uh, here in CMC, where you know you start off uh, with an MIC. So here I've got a bug uh, right on the top of the curve, which is actually sensitive, okay? As the days are going on, it's acquired some new strains here, new maybe new plasmids, and you can see that the MIC is actually going up. Okay, so that's what happens when the drug dosing is not correct, when the drug is not appropriate, and it is even though you know your initial uh, blood culture has actually shown that you are giving an appropriate drug. If the patient is not improving, you may have to think that when you send a repeat culture, don't be surprised if the MIC has actually gone up, okay? Remember, all the factors that we talked about earlier, the pharmacokinetic changes, may have led to inadequate drug levels in the patient's body, and that uh, uh, contributes to resistance, inducing resistance when you have inadequate drug levels of the antibiotic in, in the patient's body. So it's always good to recheck an MIC. This phenomenon is known as MIC creep. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the hematology patients is one frustrating group of patients for us. Uh, your patient is uh, septic, uh, but the cultures are forever negative. And uh, um, this actually can happen in as much as 30% of patients with septic shock. And from studies, they've actually shown that the outcomes of culture positive is no different from patients with culture uh, negative sepsis. So it is very important to be able to identify just because the cultures are negative, it does not mean that you stop all antibiotics if you as a clinician actually feel that the patient was septic to start with. Um, so uh, as intensivists, I think that is one thing which we have to be very clear about whether the patient was septic or not in the first place and uh, stand by your uh, decision. If you're very clear that the patient was septic, even if cultures are negative, you, you may have to continue antibiotics for the, uh, for the duration, especially more so if the patient has shown clinical improvement. Uh, you can see here in this picture, what this is actually showing is that as the patient goes into shock, the chances of positive cultures is much higher as opposed to someone who's just septic or severe sepsis. I know now the entity of severe sepsis is non-existent, but uh, as the patient goes into the shock, uh, more likelihood of uh, getting positive cultures. Uh, patients who have not been on antibiotics, you have a much higher chance of getting a positive culture, whereas patients who have been on antibiotics before who have received antibiotics prior, which a lot of our patients before they come to hospital have received antibiotics at a local GP. Uh, and there the rate of positive blood cultures actually goes down to as low as 30%. One very important thing is actually seeing how the residents take the blood cultures. Uh, Taking blood cultures in ICU, I'm, I'm sure all of you who have actually tried to take blood cultures from ICU patients know how difficult it is. 
we all know the hypoalbuminemia, the edema, which is there. And then the consultant just walks in and say, take a blood culture or take two blood cultures, not just one blood culture, but two blood cultures. And it's extremely difficult to actually get an adequate volume of uh, blood because you may be doing it under ultrasound guidance. You may not be able to see a vein. Uh, as you can see here that the yield of positive blood cultures increases as the amount of blood you uh, get for the culture. Uh, so uh, you must ensure that at least, you know, 10 to 20 ml of blood is collected. And the more number of uh, cultures you take, I know the, it, it's frustrating when the consultant says to take two blood cultures, but actually what they have found is the yield of pathogen recovery is more, the more number of sets of uh, cultures that you take. Um, so, uh, just one set of culture may not help. The other thing which I would like to also stress about is, you know, uh, taking, you know, many times uh, when arterial lines are started, we send a culture. Uh, getting an arterial bloodstream culture positive is actually very, very low as a compared to the venous bloodstream because it's a very fast moving uh, circulatory uh, system and uh, seeding of organisms uh, and actually getting culture positivity, the yield is much lower. So better to get uh, venous blood samples for uh, blood cultures. And lastly, uh, before we go on to the cases is uh, the non-infective causes of sepsis and the sepsis mimics, which are a huge number. And uh, you actually, you know, every day when you see your patient, patients not improving uh, despite antibiotics, you've done CT scan or something like that, you know, and you've actually not found anything positive for the patient, make sure that you start thinking of the unusual causes of uh, sepsis-like syndromes, uh, maybe autoimmune, as some of you mentioned, endocrine disorders, heat-related illnesses, pancreatitis. There's so many mimics of sepsis, the list can go on and on. And the only way you can actually figure out uh, whether this uh, patient has this is by looking at the patient. Move away from the computer and look at the patient and see uh, what the patient actually may have. So just to conclude, I'm going to end, I'm going to put that slide up again where you have the time dependent, concentration dependent. I think if the culture is positive, in your mind, you must think, is it because the of host factors? As I said, you may have an increased volume of distribution uh, have you given an appropriate loading dose, appropriate maintenance dose? Um, uh, have you looked uh, whether uh, you've achieved appropriate source control, looked for complications? Uh, ensure that you're giving the right drug uh, at the right dose. And if it is a time-dependent antibiotic, please make sure that you're giving an infusion. And always remember that even if initially your antibiotic was sensitive uh, uh, your bug was sensitive to the antibiotic. If you are giving inadequate uh, drugs, uh, either because of host factors or drug factors, they can be the entity called MIC creep, but the MIC may actually go up. And uh, when you repeat the blood culture, you may actually find that the patient has actually become resistant. And if the culture is negative, please ensure that the culture has been taken the right way. Uh, or consider non-bacterial causes of sepsis and the sepsis mimics. Uh, it is still not clear whether therapeutic drug monitoring will help in improving outcomes in persistent sepsis. And we do need a lot more clinical correlation studies, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, so this is just, again, just to kind of uh, recap, again, just so that you all remember this, uh, the drugs, uh, the time-dependent antibiotics, of which beta-lactams is a classical example. These are all antibiotics which we use commonly, beta-lactams, carbapenems, okay? Linozolitis, as I mentioned, that the yellow ones are actually lipophilic and the white ones are hydrophilic. So these are drugs where you must ensure that you're giving uh, appropriate loading dose and appropriate maintenance dose. Aminoglycosides, daptomycin, amphotericin are concentration dependent, dependent on the peak concentration, usually a once daily dose. Again, here for the hydrophilic antibiotics, ensure that you're giving the, the maximum end of the, uh, the dose for the patient uh, as much as the patient can tolerate based on the renal function. And these are drugs which are both time dependent and concentration dependent antibiotics. Um, vancomycin, 
uh, colistin. The classical example of this is actually fluoroquinolones, which you will see in most textbooks. So um, I'm going to stop here, and uh, we we have a couple of uh, case discussions. Uh, Dr. Anup, should I proceed with the case discussions? There are a few uh, queries. I think we can uh, clear that. So one thing regarding the colistin loading, though. All right. Like whether we have to give the same uh, nine million or twelve million units. Yes. Patients with renal failure also, or you have to so modify. I, I I couldn't hear you, Anu. No, no. Whether we have to modify the loading dose in uh, renal failure, colistin. Colistin. Whether we have to modify the dose or not in uh, loading dose in renal failure. So again, I will just stick to whatever I've said earlier. Okay, loading dose, maintenance dose, day one, give full dose. From day two onwards, uh, adjust according to uh, uh, creatinine clearance. And uh, second question is regarding the next dose. Like uh, when we give a meropenem as two gram loading dose, and when you go for an extended infusion, will you start the extended infusion immediately after the loading dose? Or will you wait for eight hours and start? So you can wait for eight hours and then you can start and give it over three hours. Uh, then, uh, can you just define culture negative uh, sepsis and for that, how many negative cultures and days are required? So I see really honestly when you when you do a culture negative sepsis, as I said, you should have taken appropriate number of uh, blood cultures. You know, at least two or three blood cultures. And we all know that it takes at least two to three days unless you have got these back tech, uh, you know, the, there are these rapid culture uh, tests which are available right now um, in some microbiology labs. So when all those tests come as negative, culture negative, and you know that you have taken an appropriate, um, from an appropriate site, as I mentioned, the vein, um, appropriate number of cultures, appropriate blood volume in the blood culture bottles and at least 40 to 72 hours, you are not seeing any um, any uh, positivity. That's how you will define the culture negative sepsis. Like uh, how often we have to repeat the cultures? <laughs> like if that, yeah. If, if the, how often would depend on the clinical situation state of the patient. Suppose I have a patient uh, who is persistently febrile, let's say on day one, I have sent cultures. I, uh, I've sent two cultures and the fever spikes are con continuously happening. Uh, I may consider taking um, a couple of more cultures, especially if the clinical situation is worsening. So remember, it's not just going to be fever. If I have a worsening micro or macro circulatory dysfunction, I may consider taking repeat cultures um, uh, and seeing whether I'm able to isolate a bug. Uh, and meanwhile, simultaneously, remember, it's not just blood cultures. You're looking for other uh, sources. So if your cultures are negative, you're also thinking, is there um, a deep-seated abscess which needs drainage? You may need to do some kind of imaging uh, to look for other sources. So it's not just dependent on blood cultures. Okay, so you, yes, culture negative. Yes, you're doing blood cultures, but that should not be the only thing uh, that you need to keep on repeating. You need to look for uh, potential sources, maybe do an echo, maybe uh, do an ultrasound or a CT scan to look for potential hidden sources of sepsis. I think we'll proceed with the case discussion. All right, okay. So uh, this is a patient actually who presented to us uh, during the COVID season. Okay, so uh, I always, uh, I was used to get frustrated in the COVID season because everybody would come in and suspect COVID uh, to the ICU. And it's actually, is a very big challenge for us in ICU. I'm not sure how many of you all face this challenge uh, to actually think of something beyond COVID. Okay, so a real case, there's a 59 year old man, a known diabetic hypertensive who came with fever and breathlessness. This is the standard COVID history, which we get uh, every day, four or five patients will get admitted in ICU with this history of fever and breathlessness. Uh, he had no real localizing symptoms, so no cough, abdominal pain, dysuria, vomiting, loose stools, no chest pain, palpitations, sweating, nothing was there. Uh, only, only history that we know is he was hospitalized in an outside hospital before coming to us. He had a road traffic accident three weeks prior to admission. Uh, he had a decompressive craniectomy, after which actually his GCS was pretty good. 
uh, he had a normal GCS. He also had a tibial fracture and underwent an uh, open reduction internal fixation. And he was uh, undergoing some debridement uh, for that uh, for, because the wound was infected. So he's come to us with uh, fever and uh, breathlessness for a day. Uh, we did his COVID test. His COVID test was negative. Uh, but um, any thoughts about uh, what uh, this patient could have? So he actually had fever spikes. He hypotensed. Uh, he was subsequently intubated and ventilated. Also required inotropes. Now, I would like to ask you all again for your choice of antibiotic. And I just want you to just keep going back to the lecture and keep thinking, what would you do for this gentleman? Um, what antibiotic uh, would you give him? I think uh, Dr. Anwar can... Uh take up the discussion. Dr. Anwar, you are with us? Hello? Ah, sir. Yeah. Actually, sir, I am thinking like he might be given some antibiotics during the surgery as a prophylaxis, maybe some ceftriaxone or something. So with, with a new onset infection after the blood culture, like as he is having hypotension also, I will start with neuropenem, carbopenem. Okay. So that's a good choice. We actually did start with uh, with meropenem for him. We gave, uh, again, as I said, this is a hydrophilic antibiotic. Okay. It is uh, time dependent. So we gave a loading dose. We gave, uh, on the first day, we gave full doses at by, by infusions over three hours. Uh, but this gentleman actually continued to deteriorate uh, despite giving this. Despite giving meropenem, he continued to deteriorate and he had increasing anotrope requirement. Yes, ma'am. Actually, he underwent a neurosurgical procedure. Yeah, so he had a neurosurgical that, procedure. It's a chance that he's having some neuro, neurosurgical meningitis or something. So we may have okay. to go for an LP also. All right. Okay, so we had actually, uh, that's a good, you're thinking about what he had. So he had an RTA, he had a decompressive. His GCS actually uh, was pretty reasonable when he came into us. He had no neck stiffness, so we didn't do an LP. Uh, anything else that you would like, you're, you're thinking along the correct lines? Um, uh, surgical side infusion, the other surgery, post-operative, yeah, so lower end surgery was also yes. there. Correct. So he did have a, um, uh, a tibial fracture. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, he was getting, um, uh, you know, he was getting debridements being done before he came to us. Yes. So potentially that site, yes, was, in, uh, was one of the potential sites of infection that we were thinking about. So we did call the orthopedic surgeon, but again, to get anybody into the ICU in COVID season is very difficult. In <laughs> Uh, I'm sure uh, many of you may be facing similar situations. We really struggled to get somebody to come and they all said, no, we'll wait for COVID test and then we'll come and see the patient. Uh, so, but the patient, I'm saying that, okay, so that site, we did some cleaning and we did something and we tried to uh, get uh, radiology portable x-ray to come, but you know, it's not Dr. the best x-ray uh, that you Dr. can Dr. get. Pidilla, many people are asking whether you have uh, uh, like considered the possibility of uh, pulmonary embolism and uh, did you investigate in that line? I don't know why there's a... Well, no, that's a good, very good thought. Yes, we did think, you know, initially. Uh, in fact, actually, this gentleman did have a cardiac arrest also. And the first thing which crossed my mind was tibial fracture, immobilized. Could he have a PE? Uh, we did do a DVT screen for him. It was negative. Uh, and we did do an echo also as well. So there was an echo done for him. And he had no evidence of pulmonary embolism. So it's a very good thought because there's inotropes in the setting of a uh, fracture. Soft tissue infection, any evidence of soft tissue infection was there clinically? Yes, yes there was some soft tissue in infection. As I said, we did whatever debridement we could, but the, the patient is continuing to deteriorate. Inotropes are going up. Seeding anywhere else, that is other question coming. Okay, that's a good thought. Seeding anywhere else. So we can look for seeding, but does anybody want to, to change the antibiotic, increase the antibiotic, add any antibiotic? See, I've told you, know, remember, time is of essence in sepsis. Uh, it is very crucial that you hit them hard, hit them early, you can hit them broad, and then you can uh, de-escalate, okay? 
So we've given Mira Panam. He doesn't seem to be improving. Does anybody have any other choices? Many, many of the people <laughs> wanted to cover up for MRSA either with picoplanin or vancomycin. Okay, fantastic. Fantastic. Okay, that's a good choice. Okay, only thing we, I mean, like, yeah, if there's a bone infection, soft tissue infection, that'll be fine. But bone infection may not really reach the bone as we saw earlier. But yes, it's good to add that. And since he was hospitalized earlier, no, he was outside in another hospital before coming here. We don't know what their carbapenem resistance is. So adding on colistin also may be a choice in this patient. So making it really broad and ensuring that we cover appropriate sources. So, um, just to, since seeding was mentioned, I'm very happy seeding was mentioned. We are thinking of potential sources. This was the echo that was actually done. It's not very clear, but this is actually the aortic valve area that you can see there. And I'm not sure whether you all can make out that there is yeah, it's, it's very, very a vegetation, clear. a vegetation which you can see here. Okay. So this patient actually had uh, an aortic valve endocarditis. It was seeding of the valve definitely from the wound. And uh, we actually had increased antibiotics to Miro, Colistin, and added on vancomycin for this patient. Uh, and uh, in, in, in endocarditis doses, but subsequently the cultures came back and you can see that this is an enterococcus fecalis, um, which was sensitive. Okay, uh, so uh, again, I just want to just kind of go back just so that uh, what uh, antibiotics do you want to give? Now, this is infective endocarditis uh, patient with enterococcus fecalis. Now it's sensitive. We can downgrade, we can de-escalate antibiotics, right? So in, in, in enterococcus fecalis and endocarditis, always remember endocarditis, it's very important that we have, again, time above MIC is very, very important, okay? So usually for endocarditis, for enterococcus, the, when it's sensitive, ceftriaxone, two grams BD dosage for six weeks, okay? Or you can give uh, along with ampicillin also. Ceftriaxone, ampicillin combination is generally what is recommended. Yeah, ampicillin also, you're giving 12 grams in four to six doses. So you can, so again, these are beta lactams. You are trying to ensure that you have uh, appropriate level of antibiotics. These are time dependent antibiotics. You think back about their beta lactams, they are time dependent, they are hydrophilic. We need to ensure adequate time above the MIC. So he was actually put downgraded to ceftriaxone and uh, ampicillin uh, combination for this for this patient. So this patient actually had an endocarditis secondary to an infected implant. Yes, he did need to undergo surgery for the implant as well in the leg, the tibial implant. Any questions on this? So can I move on to the next case? Just one yeah. last case. Yeah, we will move on to the next case. Okay. So uh, this is a 52-year-old man whose uh, past history of COPD admitted to the ICU with severe abdominal pain and fever for 48 hours. And the pain is predominantly in the right upper quadrant and epigastrium. On examination, the patient was ill. He was tachycardic, tachypnic. He was febrile and he was hypotensive. 90 by 40. On examination, he had guarding and tenderness on palpation. Chest showed some bronchi uh, on uh, clinical examination. Uh, so, uh, so gentleman with right up, upper abdominal pain, he had a leukocytosis with neutrophilic predominance. He had um, increased total bilirubin, increased direct bilirubin, mildly increased SGOT, SGPT, mildly increased uh, alkaline phosphatase. Amylase and lipase levels were sent, which were normal. Uh, his, he had a lactate, which was 3.2, um, an ABG, which showed a mixed metabolic respiratory acidosis uh, and uh, otherwise was reasonably okay. Um, so what do you think is the most likely cause of this patient's sepsis? I think uh, Dr. Nishan Bariga, your mic is enabled. If you can attempt, you can proceed. Introduce yourself and proceed. Hello, ma'am. <clears throat> yes, hello. I am Dr. Nishant from uh, Tata Memorial Hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, ma'am, uh, this is a uh, COPD patient coming with right upper abdominal pain and sepsis. Mm -hmm. So, but amylase lipase are normal. And yes. So, uh, I would like to consider uh, uh, different. My differentials will be uh, probably. Uh, Mm, cholecystitis or uh, 
uh, with the deranged uh, liver function test maybe uh, liver abscess or uh, anything mm-hmm. on the or it yeah or or it could be even one of these tropical diseases as well no so it could be one of the common tropical diseases yes sir but definitely as you mentioned correctly cholecystitis liver abscess so how would you like to confirm your diagnosis ultrasound abdomen and yes fantastic blood. okay so i'll give you the ultrasound abdomen report okay and uh, you can tell me what you interpret from it so the ultrasound abdomen actually showed a distended gall bladder okay and the gall bladder wall uh, was thickened and when the radiologist did the ultrasound abdomen and pressed the probe on the stomach on the abdomen there was a positive murphy sign um uh, would you like to i mean modify your diagnosis slightly based on this it's still a cholecystitis okay yeah, so yeah. this patient sorry recall uh so based on the ultrasound finding uh, will you change your uh, like opinion or what is your uh, comment now like there is an uh, like uh, uh, probe tenderness for uh, uh, like in the right hypochondrium or like an ultrasound uh, probe uh, uh, and the murphy sign with the probe Yeah, and there is no stone also. A calculus cholecystitis. Yeah, so this is an A calculus cholecystitis. Okay, so suppose this patient's cultures come negative, and uh, honestly, we actually had a patient recently who had a very similar picture, but fortunately, one of the cultures came positive, and hence we were able to uh, treat the patient. But occasionally, if your cultures come negative, uh, and the gallbladder is really distended, uh, you may need to actually. drain the gall bladder with a, a percutaneous cholecystostomy Col- as well Col- uh, so what are the common um, and now keeping in mind keeping in mind the uh, what you said what what you have correctly so mm-hmm. it's very important to keep the patient's clinical picture in mind and you have very correctly uh, come to a conclusion what antibiotics would you want to give for this patient so biliary sepsis usually gram negative organisms are uh, most common so i would like to use my empirical uh, uh antibiotic would be uh, like uh, uh, either uh, third generation cephalosporin or uh, based on the clinical picture uh, th- i would like to start with the third generation third generation cephalosporin along with uh, aminoglycoside do you consider any other point other than the sensitivity when you are treating a and the, the uh, site also i would like to uh, yeah so of- which are the is antibiotic with the excellent concentration in it is like it is like it is like could be a good antibiotic for biliary sores okay as a single agent you want to start with tg cycle no 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 sir along with uh, uh either uh, third generation cephalosporin third generation cephalosporin and tg cycle anything else or piperacillin tazobac okay then other Pepe- option Mm. Mm. Where are penam people are commenting? Metronidazole. So anyway, don't uh, metronidazole don't require here for cholecystitis, uh, especially when you have piperacillin tazobactam or uh, something else. Yeah, cefaparazone tazobactam, piperacillin tazobactam. Yeah. Mm. B L B L. Yeah. So yes. uh, yeah, binna pi. Okay, so as I mentioned, if the patient is not improving, uh, let's say despite, suppose your patient continues to deteriorate, you put a percutaneous uh, cholecystostomy. Anything that you will be thinking in terms of? So you have started uh, appropriate antibiotics. You have. Um, so that that's when you need to think of complications okay like maybe a perforation maybe gangrene whatever it is or a emphysematous uh, gallbladder and you may have to think the patient may need to go in for surgery so okay. always think why is the patient not improving is it because i'm giving inadequate drugs inappropriate drugs or is it because the patient has developed some complications needs which needs an alternative management okay so uh 
I think we've had enough questions. Uh, but if there are any more questions, I'm uh, happy to uh, take uh, questions. We will have a few more sessions on antibiotics. Don't worry. So many people wanted to know how to interpret antibiotics. So those basics we'll again discuss, especially the concentration, uh, the, like the site-based antibiotic and other thing, hydrophilic, yeah. inbound uh, antibiotic, all those things we can again uh, discuss once again. Yeah, these are things which are very difficult to remember, but I think just remember that majority of the antibiotics that we use in intensive care are hydrophilic and majority of the antibiotics that we use in intensive care are time-dependent antibiotics, other than a few exceptions like aminoglycosides, amphotericin, which are concentration-dependent, or even uh, quinolones, linozolid, which are both concentration time-dependent. So we, because they are mainly time-dependent antibiotics that we use in intensive care, we just have to make sure that we are giving uh, frequent doses, infusions, uh, that is the that is a take back take home message which I would like uh, everyone uh, to keep in mind. People are asking about uh, Paul Merrick's regime of thiamine vitamin C uh, combination. Uh, I've I've got another uh, another presentation on sepsis which I can take. So uh, there's a, that can be a, another topic of this discussion about the Merrick's uh, regimen of thiamine vitamin C hydrocort. That study did show the before after did show evidence of benefit. Uh, in terms of hospital duration, but the subsequent studies which have been done have not really shown any difference or any benefit. But does the citrus trial, no? They test? Yes, yes. And there's a vitamins also study which has been done. Now he has again come up with a multiple combination for COVID also. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Zinc, uh, uh, melatonin, uh, steroid, uh, so many things. So this time uh, the list is a bit huge. It's bigger. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any oh. other? ICMR guideline says piperacillin tazobactam is not recommended in septic shock. Now that is again a confusing thing. The majority of the persons say that even uh, uh, like Harrison says that whenever there is a hemodynamic instability, yeah. always go with carbipenem. Uh, but yes. that's a bit uh, controversial, I'll say. Yeah. Uh, because depending on your institutional protocol, the sensitivity, yes. etc., you should yes. uh, select that. In my hospital, I still yes. prefer to use a BLBLI combination. I will not go for a yes. carbipenem. But obviously, yes. if the patient is not responding to BLBLI, continue to be yes. sick, at that yes. point, we may uh, think about escalating to carbipenem. Yes. So yes. it is very, very important that your institution should have an antibiogram. And based on that only, uh, you will be able to select. That's perfectly correct. I mean, definitely I agree with you. It really depends on your setting and your hospital that you're in uh, to know what antibiotic you should start. And you must, every year the protocol may change. This year it may be one. Next year, if the bugs are changing, you may have to change protocol. So depends on the antibiotic. I definitely agree with Dr. Anup. People are asking about a single bottle culture, especially in pediatric age group. So pediatric age group, it is different. You have separate... Uh, uh, but plus uh, uh, bottles, that is different. In adult, we always go with uh, anaerobic and aerobic. Don't uh, feel that whenever you look for an aerobic organism, why you didn't need an anaerobic uh, bottle. It is not like that. Sometimes you can have a, a better growth in anaerobic uh, bottles as well. So it should be always a combination of anaerobic and anaerobic. And that that is a, sorry, anaerobic and aerobic. That is a one set of culture. Yeah, I think now nowadays also depending upon your lab and your the hospital, uh, occasionally some bottles can you know you can have a um, like we have a single bottle in which we can actually get both anaerobic and aerobic culture. So I think you you have to check in your hospital and see uh, with your lab or with the labs uh, and the culture bottles that you have whether you need a separate anaerobic culture in addition to aerobic because okay nowadays many of them can pick up both in the same uh, culture bottle. Uh, there is one more uh, nice question from Dr. Ajil. He's asking, whenever you think about uh, repeat bulk culture, is it necessary you have to wait for a fever spike? And during the spike, uh, you have to take a culture. So, um, see, the repeat blood cultures definitely in... Uh, uh, situations like staph aureus bacteremia, candidemia is recommended 
either every day or every other day to ensure clearance of the uh, anti my uh, of the bug but otherwise uh, honestly speaking like, like suppose i've got a gram negative bacteria i'm giving up of antibiotics fever is coming down um i very rarely do a culture on 48 72 hours to see whether the bug is if the patient is clinically improving i don't uh, recheck uh, with a repeat culture um, unless there is uh, any signs towards deterioration now there is about timing of blood culture interestingly uh, what uh, the literature says is it's very difficult to say but then you know like uh, as you uh, become experienced in the field there are situations where you know that the patient is going to spike a fever patient has actually has not spiked a fever but you see the temperature and the heart rate chart actually crossing and you know that the patient is going to spike a fever that is the perfect time to send a blood culture uh, that uh, what what the evidence has shown is if you take a culture just before the spike of fever that's when the yield of microorganisms is maximum uh versus taking it during the spike of fever many times we do take cultures only during the spike of fever i think uh, we have covered uh, almost all questions and again uh yeah so i think uh, almost all uh, we have covered and i think uh, we will again uh, join with uh, the sessions on antibiotic uh, sepsis um and some similar topics uh, to start with and then obviously uh, uh, other areas like uh, you have already mentioned the quality or so you are a quality deputy director there i, I think so i i i see quality indicators is i think another topic which we can discuss okay okay so thank you so much uh, like uh, thank you uh, friends for attending this session so tomorrow we'll be having a case based discussion on snake bite management again our herpetologist uh, joes and uh, uh, dr uh, uh, jayesh from uh, calicut medical college both of uh, them will join us and uh, we'll be having this uh, youtube recording and again the pdf version of uh, this presentation also uh, we'll be sharing so you can go back see this thing uh, especially this uh the tissue uh, sorry concentration dependent time dependent uh, the different tissue concentrations all those things are very very important things so you have to go back and read those things anything else about reading antibiotic you want to say something dr pinilla think she is having some uh, net connection issues okay so thank you dr yeah uh dr vaidya dr pinilla is back so do you want to uh, give them any advice especially our dm dnb trainees about uh, learning antibiotics how to start how to proceed really sorry uh, binila is having some uh, network issues so thank you uh, dr binila for that excellent sessions and again a wonderful surprise uh, you have uh, uh, they presented it uh, very well so uh, can you answer that question you are muted you are muted you will have to unmute no i actually didn't hear the question because no, no. i think for like a moment any of uh, the, like especially the critical care trainees they are confused from where to start reading uh, antibiotic and how to uh, like uh, uh, vast in their uh, knowledge base about antibiotic how to start and again proceed in few words uh, so um, especially i think uh, in uh, the dm in i think critical care the main issue there are three groups of people mainly coming pulmonology medicine and anesthesiology so those who are joining from anesthesiology i think they'll be having only uh, uh, like an antibiotic basis what they have learned in mbbs which they might they might have almost uh, uh, forgotten and again they may not have applied it in their clinical practice as well so what is your advice see uh, a very uh, a simple book uh, to start off with Uh, just to understand the basics is os textbook is fantastic in terms of very simple uh, understanding of the subject of pharmacokinetics uh, and uh, i'm happy to forward some articles uh, if that will help uh, through uh, dr anup yeah we can post uh, in our telegram group yeah which uh, the pgs can use uh, for their uh, reading and that pdf of that textbook is also there with me i'll try to find out and uh, share that sure sure please yeah 
and those who are interested can again like again it's subscribe. it's the os textbook i think someone could not hear os textbook o h o okay yeah so uh, thank you so much uh, thank you dr binila for that excellent presentation and again uh, as i have already told initially uh, you are interested in teaching we will uh, definitely would like to uh, utilize and uh, definitely we would like to have you in our platform again with the topics uh, which you are interested sorry been like having again network issues again so uh, thank you so much and uh, good night uh, thank you dr binila yeah. thank you dr binila good night you have, thank you. You have thank some you uh, network thank, thank you so much yeah yeah, yeah network problems are there yeah. thank you thank, thank you, you. Thank you.